Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's really good to be here at the University of Tennessee. Um, I've really enjoyed my time here so far. And it's great to be at Nimbus. First time I'm talking here. And I actually never set foot in this building until I came uh, here as, as a new assistant professor. And I love it so far. This, every, everything you guys are doing here is, is spot on. Um, so yes, today I'll be talking about modeling invasions at multiple scales. And this is sort of a, a progression of work I've been doing uh, since I was somewhere in the middle of writing my dissertation. Uh, so a brief outline of, of some of the things I'll talk about today. Uh, spatial dispersal with, with organismal dynamics. Um, this is this cheatgrass is where I got started on this. Uh, the idea of cheatgrass spreading over a very large area in Rocky Mountain National Park. So I was thinking about invasive dispersal and then um, in Rocky Mountain National Parks, there are all these roads, and, and human factor is very big. So I started thinking about networks uh, on top of that. And then after I got my PhD, I, I tried to focus more on, on a manageable problem, you might say, something that wasn't the size of, of, of this enormous park. And, and I got interested in parasitoids and, and how one could say something about dispersal with, with sparse data on a smaller scale. And, and then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the, what I'm doing now and how I'm extending some of these ideas. So my background is, is on data-driven mathematics. I'm really interested in, in problems and application, uh, problems in which there might be a, a little bit of data. More is nice, but, but maybe, not, maybe there's not a whole lot. Um, in complex systems, so we call it ecological systems. Um, and, and in particular, I've gotten really interested in in organismal ecology, how organisms are, are moving around, um, the behavior that they might bring to the system. Um, and, and so I got started in this, of course, in dispersal, and, um, and that's what I'll be talking about today. But there's more aspects to this, right? So there's aspects of moving around on a network. There's aspects of, of uh, almost like social constructs that can come into this. And I'm starting to branch out into some of these ideas now. So uh, why are we interested in, in understanding dispersal? This is the big topic of today. Um, it's because biological invasions have this, this dispersal, this movement at the core of their success. This is how they, they get around. And it's true for, for both harmful invasions, the one that make the news, such as, well, in my case, cheatgrass, but maybe more, more big name is something like West Nile virus or emerald ash borer is, is something you might not have heard of, but it does this terrible stuff to trees. Um, so lots of things can be considered harmful invasions, but there's also these, these intentional biocontrol invasions that go along, uh, that happen all the time that you don't necessarily hear about. Things like parasitoids, lady beetles, lacewings, that are, that are released intentionally to control another population. And uh, in both these cases, the dispersal is, is really a combination of, of short-range actions and long-range actions. Um, and, and these are typically caused by completely different things. Um, sometimes on the short range, it could be just crawling around the ground, for example, or, or drifting downwards, whereas long range could be picked up by eddies and carried above the tree canopy and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, and this long distance dispersal is, is the part that gets all the attention because if you want to try to talk about the front of the dispersal, you really need to understand this, right? But it's very, very random. It's very poorly understood because it's random and because you're usually talking about very small things going long distances that are hard to find afterwards. There's no data on this. Right? Um, so this is sort of where I stepped into the problem um, and thinking about especially long distance stuff with cheatgrass. Right? I've got these little seeds and now they're, they're on next to mountain ranges and, and going long, long distances. Um, and, then that, and then later I'll talk a little bit about the, the more close-in part of this with the parasitoids. So what is cheatgrass anyway? I keep saying cheatgrass. Um, it's this weed. Uh, it's, it's kind of spiky. In fact, I, I learned when I was doing my, my job interview here that uh, in Greece, they like to take these things like darts and throw them at people because they stick on their shirt. Um, but uh, anyway, they were introduced to the United States in the late 1800s. Um, 
really highly invasive. Uh, this stuff is all over the place now. And it's, it's kind of terrible for a lot of reasons. One is it takes over natural rangeland. Another is because um, livestock really hates this stuff. So it, it, it sticks to cows' mouths and hooves and irritates them. Uh, it's also really flammable. So, you know, with all the fires in Colorado that have been in the news, and, and this stuff is just standing fuel out there. So um, it destroys a lot of winter fo forage and, and wildlife cover when these fires happen. All right, so when I, when I was thinking about modeling this, there were a few things that I, I, I immediately thought, oh, okay, I need to make sure that I'm taking this into account. All right, so one is I'm, I'm going to make a simplifying assumption and say this stuff has no natural competitors. So this is not a talk about uh, predator-prey models or something like that. I'm talking about stuff that doesn't really have a competitor. It's invasive, and it just takes over where it can. Um, and then there might be some places where it can't get into because of, of concrete cover or something like that. But, but species to species, it's, it's not really got a competitor. Um, okay, but yes, there, there are things like mountains or lakes or roads, places where it's not going to grow. Um, the climate needs to be right. And, and this can affect both the amount of, of the grass that's there and also how well it spreads. Um, and yeah, this might sound, sound really obvious, but uh, a lot of early models of spread were diffusion models, which made a lot of sense because if, if you're familiar with the history of, of mathematical models of spreading things, it all began with, with diffusion back around the time of Einstein. And, and that doesn't work here because plants don't get up and move. They don't spread out, right? Yeah, they send out seeds, and, and they themselves stay put. And they can also jump over obstacles, which is also something that uh, diffusion doesn't do. So you want to be able to go over certain barriers. In my case, I was thinking of large hills, mountain ranges, that kind of thing, maybe, maybe forested areas or roads. OK, so yes, we don't want to think about diffusion then. Fusion bad. All right, so um, what, what you typically do then to accomplish this kind of thing is you use what's known as a dispersal kernel. Um, and all that is is some kind of, of distribution. You say, uh, let there be a plant at the middle, and then the seed will end up somewhere in this umbrella, um, which has tails at the end. So it could go quite far, but with a smaller and smaller probability. Most of it sort of lands nearby. And uh, when you want to spread things, you use this, this partial differential equation, um, and it just becomes a, what's known as a convolution. And you can do this in continuous time. I, I mostly consider continuous time because that's what I felt comfortable with at the moment. Uh, but you can do it in, in discrete time, too. And a lot of attention has been, been um, focused on how to define what that curve should look like. There's a lot of literature saying, oh, it should have heavy tails, um, and it should be kind of tall in the middle. So not necessarily like this, but, but maybe a little bit more pointy in the middle and, and longer at the ends. OK. But uh, in our application, there's, there's, there's a few more things I have to consider other than just how am I going to spread the stuff. Um, and, and one of those things is that I don't have a lot of data at all. Rocky Mountain National Park was, is very big. And canvassing it all for something like populations of grass per I don't know, square 100 meters or something like that is just never going to happen. So they kind of know where it is and where it isn't, and they might have guesses about other locations. Um, so this is true a lot of the time for invasions at large scales. Everything is presence absence. Is it there or is it not there? And if it's not there, when will it be there? Right? Um, I mean, the question that, that I got asked by ecologists in the area was, we want to know what we, we assume it will be on the other side of the park at some point. When will it be there? We have no idea. You know, or, or we know it's in this area now, and it's not over in this area. When will it get there? We know it will be there eventually. So in this sense, modeling presence probability is preferable, right? Because you can say, all right, well, if you go out next year, it will be there with a 40% chance. Right? That's, that's the idea that I was trying to get at. 
Um, and, and of course, in a place like Rocky Mountain National Park, then, that has everything to do with the landscape. So there's things like distance from roads. This stuff likes to grow near roads because that's disturbed ground. That's where all the humans are. Um, things like how woody it is, the elevation. Maybe you're not expecting to see it all the way up in the tundra where there's nothing but snow uh, most of the time, maximum temperature, things like this. There's a whole lot of variables that could possibly be involved in this. Um, so I needed a way immediately of taking this enormous complex system that is the ecology of Rocky Mountain National Park and trying to focus it down on cheatgrass. Um, so this is where niche modeling came in. This is the first time I had ever heard of it. And, and right, there's a workshop on this at Nimbus coming up. So definitely I have plans to be there. Um, <laughs> that I, I didn't do this myself. My collaborators did the niche modeling. But this, I think, is a powerful tool for mathematics because, you know, we want to think of things as like, oh, I, I need a parameter, right? And, and what the ecologists often give you are, here's all these maps. Of, of data, if we're lucky, you know, and, and they have things like climate data, maximum temperature, minimum temperature, average temperature, precipitation, elevation. How do you take all of those things and turn it into a parameter in your model? And I think niche modeling is a really good way of doing this because it does the statistical legwork. It, it can focus you in on a species. So the idea here is that if it's if you take uh, the presence points, you, you know where it's been found, and you correlate that with these environmental variables. And then you get a probability that it could survive and, and eventually be in another location that you haven't found it. And again, that has no temporal component, but it gives you a spatial component. It gives you this, this idea of suitability. How suitable is this location for that, that plant? So we assume we have this function. And this parameterizes our model. And then we go and do a lot of math. Um, so basically what happened here is, is I looked at the probabilistic transition probabilities. And, and I was able to derive an equation that gives you spread of this presence probability as a function of, um, as a function of this spatial heterogeneity, which I'm taking to be this niche modeling. Right? So, so we, we parameterize this. Um, there's a lot involved here, which I'm going to gloss over in a big chunk. Um, one has to do a lot of fitting for this model because it's a probabilistic model, but you can bootstrap it. But it's sensitive to data because it's non-local. Lots of issues here. Um, the end is that you can typically get decent approximations for about 10 to 20 years in the future, which was actually a static. That's much better than I that I needed, I, five years would have been great. So it's sort of um, it's, it's a good method if you have a lot of time and computing power on your hands, and you need to know something like this. All right. So what can you do? What, what are the results of it, anyway? Um, the good news is that um, in, in our tests, error was, it was really nicely controlled. Absolute error goes up because this is a circle that spreads. And as a circle spreads, the, the um, circumference gets bigger, right? So the area. But if you normalize over that, that length, it actually stays constant. Um, you can test the model because you can bootstrap from the, the underlying probability distributions. And the model stays pretty true to the stochastic realizations. All of that. Um, doesn't matter so much, though, because when you go and try it out in real life, it doesn't do so hot for a glaring reason. Um, and that's that there are these roads here. And when you're spreading things with a, a seed kernel, you're not thinking about roads. You're just thinking about how far away from the plant you are. So you get. I mean, these aren't exactly circles. They're kind of close to circles, but they actually have information, um, a lot of information in their edges. And information about their shape is coming from the heterogeneity in the background. But yeah, these guys right here are getting there because people are hiking, picking this stuff up on their socks, and dropping it off. And when you have the real problem of, hey, how long until it gets over here, 
That's what matters. So we had to look at dispersal networks. So the idea here is, OK, the real critical behavior in this dispersal problem is that I have an invader that is being spread by another organism's behavior. So can I figure out how to model that, org that organism's behavior, that is me and you, carrying the cheatgrass? And so I say, OK, well, let's suppose that everybody is, is either a susceptible or a carrier. We just basically gank this from the, the infectious disease modeling literature. All right, so you're, you're wandering around, you're going for a hike in the mountains, you're susceptible to picking up some cheatgrass. And then you get to your trailhead, which is where cheatgrass loves to grow, and it gets on your socks, and now you're a carrier. And now you go hiking, and you make it over to Bear Lake, very popular location, yeah. And then, of course, you're walking around Bear Lake, you're checking out um, the stumps or whatever you're doing up there, and it falls off. All right, so then it's going to grow there next year. All right, so, so places like trailheads and, and points of interest like Bear Lakes become nodes on a network then. Um, the places in between, I assume, um, are, you're already sort of spreading it along the trail because the, the spatial heterogeneity includes these kinds of information of distance from trail. So I didn't worry about that too much here. Um, and then you could also get in your car and that kind of thing. So I wanted to think about really long distance transport um, from one point directly to another. So we're thinking about a network, and there's some traffic flow between different points. And so when you model this, it looks like a system of differential equations, which you can compactify down. You just say, OK, I've got, um, I've got one equation for every node, and uh, sorry, two equations for every node, one for susceptible, one for carrier. All right, so vector of susceptibles, vectors of carriers, where the vector is the, 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 the dimension of the vector is the number of the nodes. And then you have a matrix that just kind of moves things around and infects things on a network. And actually, this is a fairly new idea, I was surprised to, to note. So a lot of people have done patch models, right, where you, you say, I've got a meta population here, and I've got a meta population here, and these patches interact. Right? But not a lot of people have thought about actually having susceptibles and carriers moving around on a network. This was slightly new here. Um, and well, and again, being an infectious model on the, on the carrier. OK, so the nice thing about this, then, this framework, is that you can attach it to pretty much whatever you want. And we attach it to the model I just showed you before with the presence probability. But if you have your own favorite spatial spread model, you can attach it to that just as well. The idea is that a network is basically a, connect, a collection of one-dimensional objects, points. right? So you need to make those points into two-dimensional objects so that they can interact with a landscape. And you do this with some kind of uh, probability distribution. You just say, all right, if I'm at this node, this node is distributed over this spatial location. And it gets infected depending upon how much grass is in that area. Um, and it can infect that area depending upon how many carriers visit that point. So once you've done all that, you need to run the model. Um, and so this is sort of non-trivial because you have to solve this PDE convolution equation on a large scale. Um, you also have a network going on at the same time. So I custom built a solver for this, which was kind of a combination of C and Python. And it's, it's floating up on the internets um, to this day. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll go back and revisit it a little bit. This was my first project, so no promises about the quality of this code. Um, <laughs> I was learning Python while doing this. I learned a lot, so if you have any questions about that, you can come ask me. Um, but what, what you get looks something like this. OK, so uh, the, the presence model are these, these blue splotches. So uh, <laughs> some, you can see how old this project is, because the first plot was that hot color, right? Red. And then somewhere in between, MATLAB and, and Python switched to a, a nice, uh, <laughs> more colorblind friendly palette. <laughs> so now we're in now we're in the future. <laughs> um, 
So uh, your presence is between 0 and 1 as a probability. So the idea is, is not that the, uh, it's not that cheatgrass is located everywhere you see this blue. It's that that is surely behind the invasion front. It has spread that far. But within here, there are patches where it just couldn't survive because there's rocks or trees or something, and, and then open patches where you would expect it to be plentiful. Um, OK, so the network nodes are given in green here. And the presence locations at the end are these pluses. And then we have the initial points here. So it's doing a fairly good job. Uh, the key things to note here are that I missed a few there. That's because there's a road I didn't put in. Goes something like that, or trail. This is actually the Bear Lake area, right there. Um, this guy is sitting there by its lonely, but that's because I had no data for Estes Park. And then I was later told that Estes Park is completely full of cheatgrass. <laughs> <laughs> so probably there's a lot of leakage here from, from the edges. Um, and, and there's this blank area right here. And it turns out, so I have presence data. I don't have absence data, OK? So that's key. And it turns out this wasn't absence. There's, there was cheatgrass all up in here. Um, they went there later and, and found it. So, so really, in looking at a model like this, because it's presence only, one has to look at coverage. It's hard to say, um, oh, you're covering too much. More important is, are you covering too little? Right? So, so in the end, we were able to do something with, with not a lot of data. We provided a probabilistic dynamic model for invasion. Um, Non-local dispersal kernel. We had letter, landscape heterogeneity in here, human seed interaction via network. Um, and we did a few other things as well. We considered control, um, but this was a huge problem. So you, you can do control on a network, which means basically you're going you're gonna to try to get people who have seeds on their socks and clean it off, or you're going to encourage people to clean off their own socks. And it turned out in all our simulations, this was highly ineffective. And the reason is because uh, w if you're only doing that, it does nothing to stop the cheatgrass on the ground. So, so the network seems to be like a seeding effect, right? It, it goes and takes cheatgrass from over here and puts it way over there and starts a population. So it seeds new populations. But after that, it doesn't do a whole lot other than seed other new populations. So if all you're doing is controlling on the network, then you can sort of prevent new populations far away from starting uh, for a little while. But the chances you're going to catch everybody with seeds on their socks is not good. And it will get there eventually and probably pretty fast, especially when there's a lot of pressure from different locations. So this just wasn't very effective by itself. You also need to have some landscape control, which is good old-fashioned spraying. Um, and even then, you know, by the time you have a cheatgrass problem that's that big, there's not a whole lot you're going to do about it. So really, this is a case of it's there to stay. Just when is it going to get to the next location? Um, so. So this got me thinking, well, what if we actually really wanted to get rid of an invasion? What would we have to do other than, I don't know, call out the National Guard and spray out an entire park? And I think the key really was, was to start early, right? You got to get it early. So the initial stages of invasion are critical, right? And, and so maybe if we focused a little bit more on, on spread at the local and the mesoscale, we could give some indication about where to go and, and stop it early. Whoop. All right. So this is how I got started on parasitoids. Now, I had never heard of parasitoids at all <laughs> before um, I, I started on this. And, and um, well, we, were, we began actually by looking at thrips, um, because thrips are sort of more of an invasive kind of thing. I'm looking at it from the other side, right? And uh, we couldn't find any data on thrips. And then we started looking at, at spider mites. If you guys don't know what spider mites are, they're kind of cool. They, they, can, uh, they have these parachutes that are made out of uh, spider silk. And, and they actually can get really, really high. Uh, planes have run into them up over the Pacific. Um, and they go very, very long distances. 
But we couldn't get any data on that either. And then we, we uh, discovered parasitoids. And if you haven't heard of parasitoids, oh man, you're in for a treat. They're like the movie Alien in the bug world. They, they go and attack pretty much every insect known to man. Um, everything, nearly everything, has a, its own parasitoid. And there's thousands of these species, tens of thousands. And they're pretty targeted. So like, if you think of an insect, there's probably a parasitoid that targets that particular insect, including other parasitoids, which are known as hyperparasitoids. So yeah, there's, there's, they're everywhere. And, and it's really neat. I mean, you can go out, and if you got tomatoes, so I, I have a friend of mine who grows tomatoes uh, just south of Chapel Hill. And I went out there one day, I was just admiring the, the crop, and I saw these caterpillars with these white things all over them. And they were, they're parasitized caterpillars. You know, and they're just eggs. And what will happen is those eggs will hatch, and then the larva will burrow inside the caterpillar, and then some days later, that will happen. They'll just bust out with all kinds of ugly little things. And then they'll become new wasps and go on and do the same thing over again. Um, sometimes they lay their eggs right inside of the bug, and then they come out as actually the full parasitoid. So uh, anyway, these guys are beneficial invasions. The nice thing about parasitoid wasps is they don't sting you. Too small. They're really small. In fact, um, fairy flies are a type of parasitoid, and they're the smallest insect, uh, less than a millimeter. And so uh, the nice thing from a point of view of dispersal is that these guys have this, this secondary effect, right? Um, I mean, the key problem with the data is that seeds go everywhere and, and then plants spring up, but you can't go infecting your area with, with cheatgrass. That's not, that's not okay, <laughs> right? Especially if you're going to look on kilometer scales. Um, but these guys everybody likes, and you can potentially see where they've been because of what they've parasitized. So, oh yeah, here's, here's a good visual of how this works. And there she goes. <laughs> so yeah, I am a few weeks later, this ant will uh, probably not be found anymore. Okay. Um, so we got lucky here because of, of this my wonderful collaborator, Nadia Christensen. So um, she was, I, when I met her, she was, um, she was in Australia. Now she's actually at the University of Singapore. And she was involved in a first time release of parasitoid wasps in Australia. So it's the first time this species had been released in this area at all, which was wonderful because later then when they went and collected in the field, if they got that species, they knew it was theirs. Um, it was multi-scale. That was the other thing. I, had, I could not find multi-scale uh, data collections of small insects anywhere. This was pretty much the only one. She collected data on tens of meters all the way out to two kilometers using sentinel fields. So really, really great data set. Um, and this is the wasp that she was studying, Retmoceris hayati. Uh, again, less than a millimeter. Uh, this one attacks white flies, uh, which are found all over the place, and actually lays their eggs under juveniles, and then they hatch and burrow inside. You can buy these things online, too, by the way, which is kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> They, they, you can get them and they'll, they'll, they'll ship them to you. Um, and this, actually, there's another one, Eretmoceris, uh, it begins with an E. It's a, it's, a slow, it's a close cousin to this one, which is even more popular. Uh, again, they'll ship them. Um, so this was the field site in Queensland. And um, data looks something like this. For short range, kind of like a cloud you would expect. On the field level, so within one of these soybean fields, there was a bit of a drift due to the wind. So again, these guys are very, very small, so they mostly float on the wind. And then 
up to several kilometers in the distance. They were able to find them. And the way they did this is they went out and collected leaves that had white flies on them. And the white flies, sometimes you can tell that they've been parasitized. They have a, a look to them. Not all the time. But you take it back, and then you watch them for a couple of weeks and just see if, if parasitoids will emerge. And the idea is that um, the, the time period from when a parasitoid lays its eggs to when those eggs hatch is, is pretty well understood. There's, there's a kind of plus or minus a few days, depending on conditions. But that's predictable. And so you can backtrack to see when your parasitoid was in that field. And there was some modeling done in this paper as well. But it was very, it was very rudimentary, um, because there is this problem of you're dealing with something several kilometers in scale, but these things are less than a millimeter. And so they just kind of let diffusion happen by itself um, by the fact that you have a coarse grid. So we were hoping to improve upon that. And we did that using Fokker Planck, if you're familiar with Fokker Planck. But it's basically just drift diffusion. So the idea is you start off with a wasp here. And you ask, where is it after one day? Well, after one day, it's probably wandered around a little bit. And it's also probably drifted. And the way it's drifted is going to depend upon what time it took off, because that's what time it took off will tell you what the wind was like. And when it floats on the wind, it will kind of end up somewhere downstream. OK? And assuming that wasps take, more, uh, take only one flight per day, which is fairly, it's a fairly reasonable assumption because these things are very small, so they have very limited energy. You're going to group the things into basically one flight. Um, and they're independently distributed. You just take convolutions, and you can get the whole group of wasps and where they'd be located after however many days you want. Um, so the main thing about this, though, is that wind conditions vary throughout the day. And also wasps are unlikely to take off at, say, 2 o'clock in the morning. So there's this active-passive flight thing going on in this model. Uh, active because you can control when you take off, uh, depending upon wind conditions. They don't like to fly when the wind speeds are high. So the, the black is the probability of flying. Green is wind speed. Yellow is your sunlight. So don't like to fly here, but oh, now all of a sudden the wind has dropped. I'm happy. I'm going to take off. right? Um, and then you also have to add in some memory of earlier conditions. So you want to be even more likely to take off because you, you didn't take off earlier. right? So you don't want to just say, oh, if the, the conditions were bad in the morning, that means all the ones that would have taken off in the morning are just going to rest in the afternoon. No, they'll probably take off in the afternoon. So there's, there's a little bit of an increase here. OK, and one of the major questions we were asking with this project was, well, um, the wind is actually in this direction. But the data collection was done in this direction. Uh, not yet, I don't think I ever answered my question as to why that was the case. <laughs> but OK, um, here are the fields that they collected in. And, and so if I'm using this drift, this, this drift diffusion model, can I reproduce what was found in these fields. Because it seems like, OK, I should be drifting and diffusing this way and not getting a whole lot over here. All right. So to answer this question, I, I went with Bayesian uh, modeling. So if you're familiar with this, great. This is a, a slight review. If not, the idea is that I have a model, drift diffusion model, and then it gives me some kind of output. That is, where, the, where I expect the wasps to be after day five, day six, and so on and so on. And then I have also some kind of observable output. So in this case, you know, I don't know where all the wasps actually were after day 10, day 11. No, somebody went out, and they collected a leaf, and they went back to the lab and had to wait for something to emerge. So I have to model that process from my model. And that gives me an observable. And then I compare those observables in a probabilistic way and try to figure out how likely different parameters are given the data. Um, so this was also pretty computationally challenging, because in order to do a Bayesian approach, you're going to have to do some kind of Markov chain Monte Carlo. And um, this is now a big 2D model. right? I'm covering kilometers. 
And the scale that I'm covering it at is something like 20, what is it, 16 by 25 by 25 meters, right? So I've got small cells, 16 kilometers squared, uh, sorry, 16 by 16 kilometers. Um, so that's, that's, I mean, I could do that pretty fast. I, I have a GPU, actually, I did it on. And I could get a model resolution done uh, for like 23 days in about three seconds. That's really fast. But not when you're doing Bayes. Because when you're doing Bayes, you want millions of realizations to even have a shot at a posterior. And there was just no way. You know, that would have taken me uh, years. Yeah. So after four months, there was no way you're getting a posterior. This is only about 200,000 realizations. But you can get the most likely parameters. And that's what we shot for. So given the most likely parameters, we go and look at how it compared to data. And we're fairly happy with what was happening in the release field. Um, I mean, this is kind of the eyeball metric. But sh you got a lot of, of um, parasitoids expected where you release them, as would be hoped. You've got some kind of drift in the direction of the wind. So this, this orange bump is, is the probability distribution. You're expecting them kind of moving that direction. And that's more or less what happens. And, and you get this interesting bump here, too, from the data and also from the model. So it's picking up things sort of shifting in directions that are not just in the average wind direction. So there's a lot of really nice information here in this model, which is, is represented by the data. Uh, but on the landscape scale, while we've got these nice cloud-looking things, and certainly it sort of looks to be going out there, it's not going out there enough. So this is the data. These were where the parasitoids were actually found. So time goes this way. These are the field labels. And basically, the higher up the alphabet you go, the further away from the release field you are. And these are the number of observations. So this has been normalized so that you can compare the two. This is the model down here. So it's, it's fine for fields A and B. And, but by the time you get out to D, you got a lot of observations here and not a lot of curve going on here. And it's not picking up these guys at all. And, and you, if you go and you look at the, the way the parameters kind of behave, the probability of you finding a given wasp in a field got really high in order to be able to match the data of the observations, unrealistically high, which is basically telling you that, no, a drift diffusion model is not capturing what is going out here on the in fields. So why not? Well, because, um, and this is just a mock-up, but, but because wind is not this thing that just blows one direction over uh, you know, kilometers. There's things like forests here and, and a river that has different pressures above it and things like that. So probably there's all this kind of fancy stuff going on with the wind, even near the, the landscape. And I'm not capturing that at all. So in order to figure out how parasitoids get out here and drift kilometers away from the release point in a matter of a couple of weeks, even that long, you need some kind of nonlinear wind effect. So that's where we're going to look at next, but it's still to be done. Um, stay tuned. So, so just a quick summary of, of what we've done to date, though. We have this nice short mesoscale model, and that works fairly well. And, and we're also really happy with this Bayesian framework. This is the first time I ever did Bayes. And, and as Lou said, I spent a lot of time at SAMC. And, and SAMC's right next to Duke. And if you know anything about Duke, it's Bayes. <laughs> And I didn't know that before moving there. And, and I was, SAMC is like 80% stats. You go to SAMC and they're all, they're all statisticians. And they will love to tell you about Bayes until you're, you're completely sick of hearing about it. But I learned a lot from those guys. So I'm glad I went. Um, and this was really cool because another takeaway I got is that up to this point, you know, I've been hanging out with a lot of people who do dynamical systems and math. And the, the, the way you fit parameters to models, I, uh, sorry, parameters to data, is you, you run your model, you see if the output looks like something you like. And if yes, you say, those are reasonable parameters, I'm done. Uh, and if no, you tweak the parameters a little bit, you rerun it, and then if you like it, you keep it, and so on. But this gives you this actual modeling framework to actually say, hey, 
I'm going to connect my data, which was collected in this funky way and is not actual population, but is these number of parasitoids that appeared from a leaf in a lab to this, this dispersal model in a rigorous manner. And that's worth doing. Even if at the end of the day you can only get maximum, uh, I, had ex I had explained to some guys when I submitted this paper, no, no, you know, like this is, it's okay that I'm only getting um, the, the most likely parameters and I'm not getting a whole space. You know, like this is, this is a big step forward when you can do this kind of rigorous modeling. So that was really neat. Um, okay, so, so how am I we can proceed from here? Uh, so this is, this is where my, my collaborations with Laura Miller come in. Um, we've been working on a lot of stuff having to do with nonlinear fluid flow. So this is Navier-Stokes equations. Um, and you can, you can interact this guy um, with immersed regions using these delta functions. So this is Peskin's immersed boundary method. Uh, and we have some software doing this in 2D. There's a lot of software out there doing this in, in 3D, and, and there's a little bit doing it in 2D, but we, we're really happy with what we've come up with ours because it's, it's in Python and MATLAB. It runs on your laptop, and so if it's something that you're interested in, you're getting, um, getting your feet wet in doing fluid flow, this is a really, really gentle way of figuring out how that works. Um, and, and we've been doing it for immersed Rods, so in, in our case, we were thinking about uh, seagrass because Laura does a lot of things in the water. But one can also think about trees in the same manner. Um, and this is a porous region. So again, here, one can think about trees or seagrass. And you've got flow going over this. And you see eddies, eddies coming off it. And I had these really nice discussions at a sea dispersal workshop I went to about exactly these eddies. Apparently, these guys are extremely important. Um, wind sort of hits these, these tree walls, and eddies there and seeds will collect all next to the, the tree line. Um, and this is just another view of this, actually. So, so we'd, like to, we'd like to take this and combine this with parasitoids. Um, oh, this and also, um, well, with parasitoids and also with, with empirical simulation, uh, empirical study. So, this is something that Laura's lab is doing, uh, where they're releasing thrips here from the, the tip of a pipette um, and filming them. So Laura's been doing this for a while, seeing how their, their wings are doing this clap and fling motion. Uh, we'd like to apply this to parasitoids to better understand the way that they float on the wind as well. So looking at this from an individual organism level as well. Um, but. Oops. Then, sort of on the population level, I've been building this guy. So the idea is you have some porous layer here. Maybe it's your forest or um, your seagrass or whatever, and, and then you have flow going over it. So this flow here at the top can be specified by the data from the immersed boundary method, or it can be something from a model you make or whatever you like. So the idea is to think about behavior of parasitoids in this flow on this 2D um, field. OK, so also I've been, I've been revisiting uh, the network a little bit. And this is really unrelated to parasitoids, but I think it's super cool, so I wanted to make sure I <laughs> included it here. So um, you know, this has been put on the back burner for a while because networks, networks are, are a, a bigger scale thing. But um, I got really interested in the meantime in, in how these networks form and how things like belief, opinion, and story narratives sort of spread on the networks. Again, thinking about invasions and, and that kind of thing. And um, I've made some headway in this. So, so one, of the, one of the things that struck me about this problem is that we don't have good network data at all. And we have certain instances where we say, oh, I've got, say, like Facebook data or something like that. Or I've got uh, data for, for Wikipedia. Discrete instances. But nobody really has a model of what these networks look like. So you can't even begin spreading things on a network unless you know what the network looks like. So 
we've been making this traded network model, um, which is almost ready to go now. And, and people have done this for a discrete trait space, but we've been doing it for a continuous trait space. So what do I mean by traded network model? So the idea here, let's just take the political thing because that's what's going on in the news at the moment. So red here is Republican, blue is Democrat. Okay, so all the Democrats, they like to talk to each other and hang out. And all the Republicans like to talk to each other and hang out. And this is exactly what's wrong with the country today. And the independents are squished somewhere in the middle. I make friends with everybody, I guess. Okay, and they're super nodes. You know, this is, I don't know, Kerry, and this is Trump, something like that. Okay, so can you grow this, right? And, and the thing is that, you know, you're not just blue or red or yellow, really. You're on a spectrum. You know, we're like Shapiro is on one end, and I don't know. <laughs> Pick, pick your favorite uh, tree hugger on the other, I guess, right? So, but most people are somewhere on, on that spectrum, and, and maybe they change over their lifetimes, too, and they change friends depending upon that, that change. So can you come up with a spectrum model for those traits and how people make friends with each other or change friendships based on those traits? Um, and this has been done for discrete trait spaces where... It's, it's not a spectrum, but it's just like A, B, C, D, or E, but not, not for the continuous. So we've, we've been pretty successful with this so far. We've got a network that evolves as it grows. It's, it's based on a genetic model, uh, Balding Nicholas, if you're familiar. Um, it's a directed network, scale-free, which is, is something you want if you're doing social networks. It's got small world and community structure, so looking pretty nice. Um, stay tuned. And maybe in, in a few months, I'll have something more for you. Um, we'd like to be doing some spread stuff with this. Um, and then just a brief overview of some other things that I do since I'm at the end of my talk now. Right? <laughs> um, this is that 2D fluid structure interaction I mentioned before. But my big thing this semester has been, uh, has been modeling opioids and, and heroin uh, in the population. So this is joint work with Nick Batista and Lee Piercy, who I, I just submitted a paper finally two days ago. <laughs> yes, <laughs> feels so good. <laughs> yes, and, and then in the future, Suzanne and, and Tricia will be helping me out with this. Um, and, and not unrelated, believe it or not, is this non-timber forest products optimal harvest model that we're doing with Aru. Um, so if you have any questions about that, and then, oh yeah, here's the shout out to the Savannah that, that Lou mentioned at the very beginning that I did back in 2016. That was, that was a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, if you have any questions about any of these guys, let me know. But otherwise, I'll, I'll just uh, thank the people I worked with on all of these, these mini dispersal ideas. Um, Sam C for, for hosting me for a couple of years, and, and NSF and the ARO for funding me. And uh, I'll leave it there. So uh, you mentioned uh, diffusion is not a really good idea for dispersal, and you need to consider. But uh, isn't it true that if you have a Gaussian dispersion kernel, it's just diffusion, and you can just approximate most of those dispersal processes by? D is it really a bad approximation, or? So it depends. It depends on if you're thinking about spatial heterogeneity or not, and it also it depends on if you're thinking about. Um, so it depends on what your equations look like. So if, if it's discrete time, then yes. If you, if you have regular diffusion, it's Gaussian. And at, at any discrete time, it looks like a, a Gaussian kernel, right? So you could do uh, discrete convolutions, and it will look the same. But the thing is that um, if I have heterogeneity, right? So let's say I, I throw in a, a, a break in my domain. And I say, OK, I cannot travel. Like the, this, this thing, it does not grow there, right? So then a continuous time model, like a heat equation model, which is classic diffusion, will not pass that barrier because it's a continuous, continuous thing. But a kernel will, 
both the screen and continuous because it will it'll go everywhere into that kernel. So they're 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 subtly different. Um, you can yes, you can certainly um, replace one with the other as long as the underlying structure of the domain is homogeneous, but not when it's not when there's heterogeneity. Other questions? So you assumed that the the parasitoid wasps are not really flying, that they're only dispersing by wind, essentially. I, right? but there's some jitter. OK. But yeah. is there any possibility that the wasps could be choosing particular habitats based on food availability or water availability or something like yes. that? And is there a way to incorporate that into the model? Yes, absolutely. Um, so yes, I, I didn't know anything about <laughs> the landscape in that one. Um, I had some satellite images, and that was about it. But by the time I got those, I was like, oh, well, hell with that. <laughs> so yeah, I, did, and I also didn't know anything about where the thrips were. So I just had to sort of assume that one location was like the other. But yeah, um, certainly, there's every reason to believe that when they're in the air, they can say, oh, look, this looks like an opportune spot, and direct themselves somehow. And this is part of the reason that, that Laura and company are looking at these, these thrips in wind tunnels and seeing how they, it's sort of at the end of this video, but they have a tendency to hold their wings up like this, like a dandelion seed, and parachute down. So they certainly have an active component where they can direct. And, and this is one of the things we want to look at in the, the agent base model that I showed, is, is what happens if you have plumes and, and behavior that would direct it down? What kind of emergent behavior do you get? Um, how could you model this without having to model every single individual wasp? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you might be able to start to get at some of these unknowns, like um, the landscape heterogeneity with satellite imagery. All right, I'll ask one then. <laughs> um, so, um, this go, go back to the cheatgrass things. Yeah. No, you don't have to go back. Oh, I okay. Just if we go back to that topic. Um, so, what is it that the managers really want to know? And I, I run into this all the time with regard to risk analysis. And what do they really care about? Is it something like, not will it be here? Okay. Right. But or when will it be here? But what's the range of times in which I, with a 95% confidence, can expect that it will be here? And it, you get this, the, the differences kind of. A right, thing, yeah. right. And what do they really want to know? Or do they not know what they want to know? That's a great question. Um, I'm not entirely sure. In this case of cheatgrass, I'm not entirely sure they, they know what they want to know. Um, I mean, so I, I've come from this with a little less knowledge of the managers in particular, because I was working with uh, the folks over at the National Resource Ecology, wait, sorry. NREL, that's right. Yeah, yeah. NREL, people associated, and with, and with the, um, and, and also with a, a government uh, well, agency there. I'm yeah, sure well, Tom that. Stolgren was that's, involved in that's that the stuff one, too, yes. right? Yeah. That's right. Um, but, but that wasn't the park service. Right? right, so they come at it from a different angle. They're interested in doing the modeling, and and oftentimes for a larger reason, like they are using niche modeling to try and and even do things with with species that are rare. So it's mm -hmm. or and on a national level, right? Um, so as far as that individual case, I think it must depend upon on what the manager's stake is. Like in, in a place like Rocky Mountain National Park, it might just be a question of managing it, right? So, 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 so part of this goes to like how much effort do they have available and how much effort then do they want to um, you know, give to a particular area in terms of clearing if they're going to clear a spray, all right, right. versus other areas. So it's not, it's potentially a spatial optimization problem. Yes, yes, I'd and agree that, with that. Yeah, so one, one particular instance that I can sort of throw out there is 
uh, for some time, it wasn't on the western side of the park. So I, if for those of you who aren't familiar with Rocky Mountain National Park, there's um, the Continental Divide, right? This big mountain range. Uh, and this is an oversimplification, but basically there's this road that goes right through the middle, kind of like it does in the Smokies. It's called Trail Ridge Road, and it goes right over the top. And there's a western side of the park that's on one side of the mountain ridge, and, there's a, and, and then the rest is on the east. Most of it's on the east. So, so this Estes Park that I showed you, that's all east. So in order for it to make it over the west, it's, it's not going to walk there by itself. Um, it's, it's mostly what they call the Walmart truck problem. <laughs> it, gets a, yeah, it gets attached to Walmart trucks and it makes its way to the other side. And actually, it, by the time I got done with my dissertation, it was appearing on the western uh -huh. side. Yeah, so the question I think, at least at the beginning when I started my dissertation was, how, what's the risk? How long until it's there? And I think managing that risk and, and saying, are there areas that we can focus on? Or, or when, it, when it shows up on the western side, where will it be? And can we focus on those areas and then hit it there? I think that's sort of getting at what they're interested in. Got it. Great. Any uh, last question before we thank Christopher? If not, let's thank Christopher. Thank